Well hello guys and welcome back to the channel. It's been a little while now since I've had a play with the RS style spoiler project and I'm ashamed to say it's been about 18 months since I started. So looking back I was just getting into producing some parts for the end plates and I discovered a problem. So I had to completely remodel the inner end plate design to make it easier to release from the mould and to make a cleaner part that goes onto the side of the spoiler. So having smoothed it off with body filler, I then used this uh, XCR epoxy coating resin to give it a nice gloss smooth surface. After a few coats you end up with something which is uh, pretty glossy and great for taking a mould from. As you can see I've got both end plates remodelled as symmetrically as I could manage. And now jumping back into present day, uh, I've got those moulds finished. So for the next phase I need to conquer the British weather, which means cold nights and keeping things warm while they're curing. So I'm going to build an oven. So let's talk about some design principles. We know triangles are really strong and they're a great starting point for a lot of structures. If you go for something that's square you have to consider parallelogramming and also the fact that you've got about double the volume uh, that you would for the equivalent base size of triangle. So I've gone for a massive Toblerone shaped oven. Take three pieces of equal size and tape them together using an aluminium speed tape. To slip in the parts and then run a piece of tape to seal the end so we don't lose too much heat. So the principle for this oven is going to be to give it one good heat cycle, make sure everything inside is nice and warm, just then switch off that heat gun and then seal it all up and leave it to arrive back at ambient temperature. Now what's nice about a triangle is if you translate that end piece slightly over to one side, you've got a hole you could poke a heat gun in. Fantastic! I want to be able to flat pack this thing eventually so it doesn't take up loads of room in the garage, so having it in this way without loads of holes and bits and pieces is probably the simplest way. I'm also trying to get a temperature gauge on there so I can keep an eye on the behaviour of the oven uh, and if necessary start designing a closed loop system with some sort of controller for the heat gun and the temperature. But we'll cross that bridge a bit later if we have to. And the finishing touch will be uh, using the top I think of the triangle as the heat gun ingress point and a bit of tape over the top. So now it's time to crack on and build the oven. I treated myself to a bit of this uh, Rectocell board, it's basically a polyurethane foam with a metal uh, face sheet on either side. I'm using some speed tape to seal it which is an aluminium foil with a sticky back so that I can handle higher temps without stuff catching fire or getting melty if I choose to later. Stick it down on one side, run your finger along so it's got a nice crease and then I'm kind of folding it back on itself so I can stick it to the adjacent board from the inside. Just like this. So basically run your fingers along, smooth it all into place and you've got a good enough seal for a home oven. Now this thing's not going to get particularly hot, I'm probably not going to take it much beyond 30, maybe 40 degrees. Now repeating the process on the other side, it's very satisfying. So just creasing that over. So we have our beautiful Toblerone tube all ready to go and it's time to think about putting those end plates on. So to minimise the amount of mess and complication I'm not going to cut them to triangle shape, I'm just going to go with a square. Come on guys, get to the chopper! The chopper predator! So, I think I got quite excited by the fact that my saw is called Predator. Uh, I've got Mini Engineer helping me out doing a bit of filming here so I could have a spare hand. I must invest in a decent tripod. Now, on to fitting the temperature gauge. Again, using that little gap on one side. Sort of poke it in with the smallest gap possible. Think about backing that out with a piece of cardboard, which I can then coat with a bit of aluminium tape uh, once I've got it the right size. And as if by magic, here it is. So I've got plenty of space in there to get in some of my bigger moulds. But before I do that, I wanted to just give it a try and see what kind of temperatures I can achieve, how long that heat gun's got to be on for. It's not a particularly warm day, about 16 degrees outside. After maybe, I don't know, 30 seconds of running the heat gun, I'm up to about 18 degrees. So time to be a bit more scientific and look at the heat loss coming from the oven. Thank you. 
I've precariously balanced, I think, a tin of GT85 or something against the other side just to keep it shut for now. So we're down to about 20 degrees after five minutes or so. Down another couple of degrees after just over 10 minutes. So now I'm being very scientific. I'm gonna gather some data and produce graphs because that's the joy of being an engineer. So let's do a little bit of nerding out. So here's the data. Um, for the first set, I have taken down the time, the temperature, and I've calculated the delta temperature. So that's the difference between the outside air temperature and what's inside the enclosure. So you can see there's a, a quite a rapid drop off within the first few minutes, uh, and then things tend to asymptote off towards the, uh, the room temperature. So after about 20 minutes or so, we've lost around 10 degrees in temperature. So if I wanted to keep this nice and hot, maybe for the first hour, I probably need to be getting a good 15, 20 degrees above ambient. So on this case, I've also had a go at opening up the end of the oven. You can see a slight drop in the temperature. I've run the heat gun for 60 seconds, but then the temperatures continue to rise after I've applied the heat. So there's a bit of thermal lag going on. Uh, and then I'm following the same kind of gradient down again the other side once it's reached that peak temperature. So it's looking like, I don't know, two to three minutes of heating is probably sufficient to get it above 30 degrees. And that should give me that magic half hour of, of curing time when the resin's starting to warm up, starting to exotherm. So I'm gonna do a trial fit of the lower part of the spoiler. Fits in very nicely in the available space, got plenty of room. And I think I'm just gonna stack the other one on top of it. Uh, maybe separated out with a bit of foam. But I'm gonna have a go at just warming up those molds inside the enclosure and I'm seeing you know, a good 20, 25 degrees on the parts. I'm confident I'm gonna get a good heat. So now I'm mixing up some gel coat ready to apply to that lovely release agented mold. Just like brushing on gloss paint, you want a nice thickish layer, aiming for a few fractions of a millimeter all over. And I'm just warming that one up while I get started on the second mold, which I'll stack on top. So I'm using the upper part of that Toblerone tube as a means to introduce the heat, and I'm using a trusty old broom to hold the door shut. I'm hoping I can get away with uh, giving this a try overnight. If I've got problems and things aren't curing, we might have to get into a, an active control system where we're able to switch that heater on and off at various points in the night. But I'm really hoping that first half an hour is enough to get the job done. Now I'm moving on to the other mold, applying that gel coat onto the surface, just as I did with the first one. On goes the end piece. Prop it up with the broom. Apply some heat. Leave that running for about three minutes or so. I'm gonna put these two to bed and come back in the morning. The following morning, temperatures drop to maybe seven degrees overnight but all the things that weren't inside the enclosure have also cured so there's hope that I've got a good quality cure on that first layer of gel coat inside the enclosure so let's go and have a little look crispy crispy gel coat always a lovely sign I've got the catalyzation about right so for these colder temperatures I've put a little bit more of the redox catalyst in there about three percent by weight if you're wanting to know it Now for the moment of truth, let's take off that ceiling tape. There's been quite a lot of trial and error involved in this process of building up a spoiler so far. I've made a lot of mistakes, but I've also learned a huge amount as well. So there's always that moment, could go one or two ways. And it looks like Got a nice glossy surface, not too tacky, that's good. It's kind of gone to the B stage, which is what I'm after. And you know what? I reckon that's pretty good. That's cured nicely, so I should be ready to then apply 
the glass fibre onto the inside of that and finish off the structural part of this uh, lower spoiler. Same for the other mould, I'm absolutely chuffed. Very shiny. Coming back the next day, let's crack out the glass fibre woven cloth. Now I'm going to be using this stuff because it's a little bit stronger than the chop strand. Uh, it's ideal for putting around reinforcing areas and also where you've got a bit more of a, a tight geometry that you're trying to stick to. So you also have to be quite careful with these fabrics. You can very easily warp them, you can pull fibres out very easily and you lose the alignment. Not so much of a problem for these sorts of projects but something to keep in mind, especially if you're going to see that weave afterwards like the carbon fibre. Very easy to snip with a pair of scissors. And now I'm moving on to the chop strand mat, which I'm going to roll out along the length of the spoiler so I get the size that I'm cutting just right. So the first bit of chop strand is in place. I'm going to stick a second piece on. So this stuff is, is a bit, little bit thinner than, than typical chop strand mat. We're talking about 100 grams per square meter. We're looking for a lightweight part, so I'm going to put some reinforcements around the end of the spoiler where I'm going to have some bolting and a couple of locations in the midpoint to act as kind of reinforcing riblets, if you will, on the inside of that wing. And then to close that all off with another piece of chop strand mat over the top. Down to my handy Kosh cabinet in here. Uh, it's definitely not a beer fridge. Definitely not a beer fridge. It's uh, a Kosh cabinet. I've got my general purpose low cost resin, which I'll be using for the layup. Um, I've already rolled out the first layer, and now I'm going to be wicking up the excess resin into those fabric pieces. Lots and lots of dabbing. doing the same thing on the ends, just wanting to make sure I've got a good wrap around the corners because those are the bits that will take the beating. It'll also be the surface that I think is the most critical for bonding onto later. So I want to make sure I've got something that's well consolidated and strong, not too many air bubbles in there. So there we go. All wetted out. So I've applied another layer of the chop strand mat over the top and I'm now rollering out all the air bubbles so it's a really nice consolidated part, not too many lumps and bumps. So hopefully it'll get good adherence onto the gel coat when I release it from the mould later. Right, let's send it off to the oven. You'll notice that I've now trimmed any excess off the uh, ends of the mould so that it doesn't stick to the doors or pull any of it up while it's curing. I'm going to put it to bed. Coming back the next day, the moment of truth. It's always a worry, because things might not have gone to plan. Let's take a look. So at a first glance, it looks pretty good. No massive sort of air pockets or anything trapped in there. Let's start levering it away from the mould, so it looks to have cured quite well. So it's always good to try and propagate a crack along. And if you're too aggressive in any one spot, you can really sort of separate the uh, glass fibre from the gel coat and it creates a big old mess. So I'm doing my best to try and follow a crack from one end all the way to the other. And lifting that part out of the mould. A little bit of pressure with those wedges on the opposite end. And I can lift that bad boy away. Let's have a look at the surface. Whoa, check that out. It's just like a mirror. I couldn't be happier. That's ace. Right, let's wipe off these bits of uh, glass fibre and uh, have a little closer look. So I've got the divots where I want them for the bolting that will go on later to the, the strakes and the end pieces and the detail seems to have come up really well. Do you know what? The mould hasn't fared too badly either. I reckon I've got another couple of shots in that before I have to rework it. Very happy. A few little bits of gel coat here and there, but hey, we're not going for perfection. Nicely cured upper spoiler. Let's see if we can free that one up. Now I think I may have been a bit overzealous in going for a really thick wedge along that edge. You can see that sort of white patch in the centre of the screen. I might have ripped the gel coat away from the um, the part. Let's have a look. Oh no. 
bit of a disaster, but nothing a bit of body filler and can-do attitude can't fix, so I'm looking forward to getting that sorted out at a later date. Uh, let's have a look at the surface of the mould itself. Yeah, I've, I've just left that on the surface, haven't I? Could be a bit of bad luck, maybe I missed my release agent, maybe I was a bit violent getting it out of the mould, but do you know what? That's good enough. The surface finish isn't quite as nice as the other one, because this mould has had a lot of rework and I didn't want to re gel coat the thing. So now sticking those two bits together, it's not very heavy. Probably talking about five or six hundred grams for that spoiler. Very happy indeed. The result of a hard weekend's work and I couldn't be happier. You know what they say, the perfect is the enemy of good enough and in this case, this is good enough. <laughs> Okay, well I guess that brings this video to a close. Uh, we've got some great results out from the Composites oven. Uh, managed to produce the upper spoiler with relatively low damage um, and actually everything released quite nicely with the wedges banging around the perimeter, popping out the parts. Uh, what you can see over here is the collection of all the bits on the floor. Uh, I'm gonna keep making up the end plates, the strakes, the other parts and the lower spoiler uh, over the next few weeks and I'll probably put an update out once all the parts are made and trimmed. And the next step is going to be gluing those together, building the assembly, and then getting it onto the car. I'll make it sound easy, but there's probably about 30 hours of work between now and then, so let's see how we get on. Uh, a big shout out to Roberto Rodriguez for staying with me all this time on the channel. Thank you very much for your patience. It's been, well, probably a good year and a half uh, along the process. And thanks to all of you guys who've been subscribing, hitting the like, and commenting below. Please continue to do so, and if you haven't already, don't forget to subscribe. For now, Engineer out.